Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Is coming home early from work such a good idea? One of today's stories has a similar plot. Enjoy the show! A few months ago, an event occurred that became the beginning of some changes in my life, and subsequently, I began to look at the world and relate to people differently. One day, a colleague invited me to meet at a cafe to discuss some details of our joint project. He had a brilliant idea and was eager to share it with me. Harry and I had been working on the layout of a future recreational park, which the director wanted to build where an old church had once been destroyed, now a vacant lot frequented by the homeless and alcoholics. The area wasn't very big, but there was still room to build something worthwhile there, so we put forward our own version of the project. Harry pulled out his laptop, searched through it for a bit, then turned the screen towards me, displaying several intricate building designs, along with some small squares featuring fountains and a children's playground. I think this will look absolutely splendid. Plus, everything is quite compact and convenient to visit any leisure spot, whether it's a cafe with ice cream or a smoking area. What do you say? Harry said. I carefully examined every detail and line. At first glance, the layout seemed quite comfortable. I'm not sure. It looks good, but don't you think our contractors might struggle to bring all these fancy features on the buildings to life? Besides, considering everything, this place will significantly stand out in the city, I replied after some consideration. What? That's the whole point. We just need to find a good engineer who can figure out how to assemble all the details. Well, it's not entirely our task. But I see it this way, as another step towards the future. Harry praised his idea as if it were a masterpiece among constructions. In the end, I supported his idea, and the next morning, we were preparing to present the project to the management. After dinner with him, I headed home. But on the way back, for some reason, I wanted to stop by that vacant lot and see it once more before significant changes began. By that time, the homeless people had been dispersed, and some construction materials had been brought in. In one corner, there was a small booth where a guard stood watch at night. He was slightly surprised by my late visit, and I told him I just wanted to take another look around. For about half an hour, I wandered through the lot, various thoughts swirling in my mind. Somehow, I felt that there shouldn't be any entertainment complexes in that place. If it were up to me, I would have restored what was there before. I believe that such a place should have a church, not something else. But my boss had his own views, and I was just doing my job, following his orders. As I was about to leave, my wife called, asking me to pick her up from her yoga class as she was having car trouble. This news didn't exactly thrill me, as I was already tired from a full day's work, and after the meeting with my colleague, I just wanted to relax even more. Initially, I wanted to tell Jody to take a taxi, but I eventually gave in to her persuasion and drove halfway across town to pick her up. It was quite dark outside, and I tried to park the car not too far away. The street seemed quite deserted, as if everyone had vanished in an instant. Instinctively, I glanced around and headed towards the building. Walking along the empty road, I thought I heard something, although until then, I had only heard my own footsteps echoing in the semi-darkness. I looked around again but saw no one. However, as soon as I took two more steps, I heard a crackle not far from the trash container. My first thought was that it could have been just an opossum, but when I stopped, dead silence prevailed. So, I decided to check, as a robber could be hiding behind the dumpster. Despite my age, I was in fairly good physical shape and was confident I could handle a shady thief, unless they were a martial arts champion. Quietly approaching the dumpster, I immediately dove behind it and tackled the person hiding there. Pinning them down, I could see under the streetlight that it wasn't a homeless person or a typical criminal. I grabbed hold, pressed my knee against their chest, and tightened my grip on their throat so they couldn't wriggle free. Who are you? And why are you following me? I demanded, noticing a camera hanging around his neck. Let me go, he croaked. You're of no concern. I'm a private detective, on a case here. If you release me, I can show you my credentials. I loosened my grip slightly, allowing him to reach into his inner pocket. He handed me his wallet, and I quickly checked his identification. Will Forrest, the detective, proved to be who he claimed. I released him and began questioning who he was actually pursuing here. 
However, he started refusing to answer, citing it as a confidential investigation and wouldn't reveal the suspect. I took his word for it, understanding that everyone was just doing their job and didn't detain him further. Will headed to his car, and I went to meet my wife. Jody looked a bit weary but greeted me fairly warmly. I intended to ask her how her day went, but she beat me to it, bombarding me with questions. She then explained that her car had stalled just a couple of hundred meters from the parking lot, forcing her to walk the rest of the way. Did you call for a tow service? I asked. When? I was already late for class. I couldn't just sit there waiting for them to decide to show up. And besides, I've been saying for ages that it needs to be scrapped and replaced. Jody, I understand you want a new car. But you know we can't afford that right now. Your car is perfectly fine. You just needed to have it taken to the mechanics earlier, as I mentioned. Now you might even get a fine for leaving it wherever you did. Let's go, check if the car's still there, and call the necessary services. I love my wife, but sometimes she overstepped, especially recently, often pressing me to spend money on her wardrobe, jewelry, or cosmetics. This sometimes led to minor arguments. Initially, I thought she was trying to compensate for our daughter Phoebe moving away to study in another state. But strangely, Jody hardly ever mentioned our daughter's name or expressed missing her, instead focusing solely on herself. And now, this unreasonable choice regarding some silly activity. We went to the spot she indicated, only to find the car gone. Apparently, it had been towed. I voiced my opinion, and she tried to portray herself as a victim again, saying I didn't pay her enough attention. But that evening, I was truly exhausted, and I didn't even want to argue with her. We just headed home. The next day, Harry and I presented our project to the manager. After a brief review, he approved it and assigned us a few more tasks. I had to meet with one of the engineers, considered one of the best, but it meant I needed to travel to another state for a couple of days. Harry was tasked with finding contractors for the initial construction. I wanted to ask my boss why he didn't send Harry on the business trip, but he never deviated from his decisions, so I decided not to waste time on that. During my lunch break, I had to deal with my wife's car, and there I met a friend who was also caught up in some situation and was due to meet with an investigator. We didn't talk for long as I was rushing back to work, agreeing to meet in the evening at a pub to chat. As I left the premises, I noticed the same detective I'd seen the previous evening. He saw me too, sitting in his car, staring intently at the entrance. I wanted to approach him, but apparently, he didn't want any more encounters with me and immediately drove off. It struck me as a bit odd that I'd encountered him twice in such a short span. But I didn't have time to chase after him, so I carried on with my tasks. In the evening, when I returned from work, my wife was at home. It was one of those rare evenings lately when she hadn't gone anywhere and I could enjoy some time with her. But I had already arranged to meet a friend and was getting ready for that. And how long will you be gone? She asked when I shared with her the upcoming business trip during my preparations. A couple of days. Maximum three. But I don't understand why you're so concerned. You always find something to do. Hmm. I was just asking. I'll invite Hillary then. We'll have wine together. It's been a while since I had a girl's night. Oh, thanks for the car, by the way. I had to take a taxi today. But still, think about replacing it. Jody, I've told you several times I'm not a millionaire. If you want a car, get a job and earn it. You know I'm more concerned about our daughter's education right now. Plus, there are plenty of other expenses I have to cover. You're just stingy, she huffed, switching on the TV and staring at the screen. The next words of mine about the need to be a little more prudent and serious, she didn't hear anymore. Realizing that it was pointless to continue talking to her, I went to meet a friend. He was already there when I arrived and had managed to have a few drinks. I quickly found him at the bar and sat down next to him. He shared with me his story that he had recently been in a minor accident when returning from a meeting with his girlfriend. I always wondered how he, being married, could have a mistress. I myself never recognized cheating in a relationship, I considered it a low and treacherous act. But even when I sometimes advised him to get smart, he never listened to me and said that it was his life and I had no right to tell him what to do. However, 
I didn't end my friendship with him because we had been friends for many years, since college, and over the years, there had been many situations where we seriously helped each other. I simply started asking who his latest puppet was. But Ed never confessed to me who she was. Rather, he described his meetings with her, how she was in bed, and much more. But for some reason, he kept her appearance or her name a secret. And according to his words, he had started seeing her quite recently, and he didn't know how long their relationship would last because this lady was financially demanding and often asked him for expensive purchases. After a while, I went outside for a smoke, to get some fresh air and give my ears a break from the annoying music and bar noise. Stepping a bit further away from the building, I took a few puffs and just looked around, sometimes at the night sky. And then my gaze accidentally fell on a car that was familiar to me. I looked closer, it was definitely the detective's car. But he wasn't visible. Still, I approached closer and hid behind a corner, deciding to ambush him. I didn't know how long I'd have to wait, but curiosity got the better of me, and I remained hidden. Luckily, I didn't have to wait long. I don't know where he had been, but soon I saw him returning to the car, and as he came close, I pounced on him and pinned him to the car. It's you again. Just don't tell me you're not following me again. Speak, who hired you? I held him by the collar and prepared to strike. Damn. Let me go. I told you, I'm not following you. A woman hired me to follow her husband. Who? I asked again. The detective only muttered something about confidentiality. But I didn't believe him anymore. It seemed to me that he was definitely following me, and judging by his words, Maybe my wife had hired him. Now I understood why she needed so much money lately. But why, since I hadn't given her any reason? What was she trying to prove with this? On the detective's neck, I noticed the camera again, and this time, I grabbed it and tore it off his neck. Will tried to take it back but only received a strong blow from me, and while he was regaining his senses, I started scrolling through the pictures on the camera. I wanted to make sure that if there were photos of me, then he was definitely following me. And now, without answers, I wouldn't just let him go. However, I didn't see myself there. The last photos captured Ed. So, his wife hired the detective. And now I was curious about who my sinful friend was meeting that it had come to this. As I scrolled further, I was shocked because in the following photos, I saw him meeting with my wife not only in a cafe but also in a motel and in a car outside the city. I couldn't believe my eyes. And then I pressed the detective again and demanded that he tell me everything, telling him that my wife was in the photos. Will said he knew who she was, which is why he tried to avoid meeting me. But it was really Ed's wife who hired him, as she had long suspected him of cheating and now wanted to divorce him, and according to the prenuptial agreement, leave Ed with nothing. I wanted to hit him, but I realized he was not to blame, he was just doing his job. I let him go but kept the camera. Returning to the bar, I walked towards Ed, filled with anger and rage. Now I understood why he had kept his lover's name hidden from me and intended to have a different conversation with him. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Approaching Ed, without unnecessary words, I simply grabbed him by the collar from behind pulled him towards me a little, then forcefully slammed his face onto the bar counter, causing dishes to scatter in different directions. But I didn't stop there. I repeated this action a couple more times. And when blood started trickling down his arrogant face, I pushed him, and he managed to turn. Hey, what's wrong with you? Have you gone crazy? He asked, barely standing. Oh, you jerk. How dare you sleep with my wife? I replied and struck him again. As the fight started, bar customers intervened. Two of them even tried to grab and restrain me, but my rage was so intense at that moment that I easily pushed them away and continued attacking Ed. Within a minute, he was completely covered in blood, trying to shout something in response. But I wasn't listening. I wasn't listening to anyone. I had enough proof that he betrayed me. Only when the bartender yelled about calling the police did I stop. I didn't want to end up behind bars, especially since I had a business trip the next day. Leaving the bar, I immediately drove away and headed home. I knew Ed wouldn't file a complaint against me since he was at fault. But now I needed to sort things out with my wife. I entered the house, loudly kicking the door open. 
Jody was sitting on the couch watching TV. But when she heard me and then saw my fierce expression, she became flustered. Hey, what's wrong? She asked, startled. But she didn't know yet that I knew everything. Just like before, she began to play the innocent lamb. Oh, you scum. How could you? I approached her and grabbed her by the hair. I do everything for you, earn money for your clothes, even allow you not to go to work, and you. Damn you. What was lacking for you? Decided to betray me? Especially with my friend? What are you talking about? Let me go, it hurts. She whimpered. Oh, it hurts for you? What about me? I loved you. And you just crushed my feelings. I forcefully pushed her and she fell on the couch. I took a camera from my pocket and threw it at her. What's this? She asked. I gave her some time to look at the evidence of her infidelity, and with each picture, her eyes widened, fear evident on her face. When she realized there was no escaping an explanation, Jody tried to prove her innocence again. But it didn't affect me anymore. On the contrary, I became even angrier, couldn't bear it, and gave her a few slaps when she tried to approach me and say again that she wasn't guilty. At that moment, she was so repulsive to me that I didn't even want to see her. I went to the bedroom and immediately started packing my suitcase. When I finished and returned to the living room, Jody was sitting there, crying over those photos. I took the camera from her, then told her to start packing her things. I demanded that until I returned from the business trip, she wouldn't be seen or heard in the house. That night, I went to stay in a hotel and from there to the airport. Of course, I wanted to meet Ed again and continue dealing with him. But I didn't have time for that now. I knew he wouldn't go anywhere anyway, and I had to do my job. The next morning, I was already on a plane, trying to focus on the upcoming meeting. But to my dismay, the image of my wife being intimate with my friend was playing before my eyes, and I couldn't concentrate. Upon arriving, I gathered myself and went to the meeting my boss had arranged with engineer Roger Mordecai. His office looked quite remarkable, I'd even say he liked to flaunt his wealth. He invited me to sit down, and as I placed my fifth place in the leather chair, I didn't hesitate and pulled a laptop out of my briefcase, as well as some blueprints for a future project. While we talked and I briefed him on the details, I noticed a framed photo on his desk. It was him and Ed. It struck me as very odd, and I couldn't resist asking Roger about the photo. Oh, that's my son, Ed. We rarely see each other. I keep his photo here. Why do you see each other rarely? It's so happened that I've been divorced from his mother for a long time. Now I have another family, but I still love that rascal. Too bad he refused to follow in my footsteps. But did you fly here to ask about my family? Oh, no. I'm sorry. I just felt like I knew him. We continued our conversation, already more to the point. I didn't want to tell him that his son is sleeping with my wife but the fact that their relatives now couldn't leave my mind. Over the next two days, I met with Roger a few more times, discussing the project. And when the business negotiations were over, I started getting ready to go home. I wasn't eager to return there, and hoping that Jody would follow my orders and leave home before I arrived. But as I entered the house, I noticed that my wife was still there. Her things remained in place, and the familiar aroma of her cooking drifted from the kitchen. Before I could even step into the room, Jody came out to meet me. Eric, listen. I feel so guilty before you. Please forgive me. Everyone makes mistakes. I love you. She tried to approach and hug me, but I just pushed her away and went into the room. I told you to leave. Why are you still here? I asked, placing my briefcase down and sitting on the couch. Jody began her pleading speech again, asking for my forgiveness and expressing remorse for her actions. Over these three days, I had cooled down a bit and could speak with her more calmly. But I didn't feel like it yet, so I asked her to leave me alone. My wife went back to the kitchen, and I remembered that Ed and Roger were related. Yes, I had noticed from the very beginning that they had the same last name, but I couldn't have guessed such a thing. Now I was even curious why he had never told me about his father. He rarely spoke about his family in general. I didn't have to go to work that day, so I allowed myself a drink. Pouring some whiskey into a glass and taking a few sips, 
I went to the kitchen where Jody was sitting at the table, scrolling through something on her phone, humming a tune to herself. When I entered, she immediately set aside the gadget and looked at me with an innocent gaze, hoping for a conversation between us. I sat across from her and started talking. Tell me, Jody. You understand our marriage is over anyway. But I want to know. Why did you do this? Why did you sleep with my friend? What did I do to deserve this? Well then, Jody put on a more serious face. If you're so curious, know this. You're to blame. I've asked you so many times to buy me a car or that necklace I liked. But you just hoarded your money as if I'm just a housekeeper to you. And you know how hard it is to keep the house in order, don't you? I'm tired of it. I wanted some entertainment, something new. New? Entertainment? Wasn't all that enough for you? Clubs, yoga, friends. Not enough for you? I started feeling my anger resurfacing. Her accusations seemed audacious to me and angered me again. You live much better than many of your friends. You're just a slut. I stood up from the table and paced around the kitchen. But Eric, I'm telling you the truth. And Ed, he's a rich daddy's boy, as it turns out. Didn't you know? But I found out, and I just wanted him to share some of his money with me. You sleep with him. Doesn't that mean anything to you? You betrayed our marriage. Years of our life. I felt the urge to slap her across her audacious face again, but I knew it wouldn't help. I returned to the living room because I didn't want to talk to my wife anymore, but now I wanted to meet Ed again. I didn't know what to do next because his father was coming to our town soon, and if he found out I had beaten his son to near death, he might refuse to cooperate with our company. But I couldn't just forget everything and leave it as it was. I wanted to somehow get back at this traitor who had eyes for my wife and, as it turned out, had been a liar all his life. Even what he said about working in some high position at a firm turned out to be false. His father let slip that Ed didn't inherit a good mind and mostly scraped by with odd jobs, and the main income in his family came from his wife's company. So much deceit around that it disgusted me. Emotions had built up so much inside me that I decided to go and look for Ed. At that moment, I didn't care how things would turn out, I just wanted justice for the betrayer. I didn't have to search long for Ed. First, I went to the place he said he worked. But as it turned out, they had kept him as a loader for several months, and he hadn't shown up for work the last week. So, I went to his home. I knew that if I called him, he wouldn't agree to meet and would run off somewhere else. As I suspected, Ed was indeed home. When I rang the doorbell and he opened it, he immediately tried to shut it again. However, I extended my foot, preventing the door from closing, and then forcefully pushed it open. Listen, Eric. Let's talk, he began, stepping back. We'll talk now, I kept pushing on, and soon we were in his living room. During this time, I noticed that his wife wasn't home yet, apparently, she was still at work. Ed being alone at home allowed me to speak more freely with him. I swung and landed another blow on his barely healed facial wounds. Ed winced in pain but prepared to defend himself. However, I simply sat down on a chair and stared at him. So, Ed. Now tell me, why did you have an affair with my wife behind my back? We were friends, after all. What made you treat me this way? I asked in a calm and steady tone. It even surprised Ed a bit, and he decided to respond. Eric. Listen. It just happened. We ended up at the same party, and things just unfolded. But I swear to you, she came onto me. I just didn't want to tell you to avoid upsetting you. But I was going to break it off with her. I swear, he explained. And you think I'll believe you? Well, I don't know why she approached me. Maybe just because I'm charming. And what about your father? Your biological father? Ed lowered his head in contemplation. Apparently, he realized that Jody was with him only for the money. It turned out that at a party, he got drunk and accidentally mentioned his father's financial status to her. But now he told me that he wouldn't inherit anything, as his father had long ago disowned him and his mother. His answer didn't convince me, although I got some answers to my questions. I stood up again and approached him. I was ready to punch him again, I even made a motion, but I was interrupted. 
At that moment, his wife returned home and, seeing me in an aggressive state, immediately bombarded me with questions. I didn't take a long time to explain to her why I had come to their house and just handed her the camera I had brought with me. And then I briefly told her what I knew about the detective and the pictures were what she expected in the show. Then I walked out of their house. I was still sitting in the car for a while and I could hear the scandal his wife had given Ed. A couple of days later, Roger Mordecai visited our company. He was ready to start working but also intended to visit his son. The next day, I saw him in the office, looking quite distressed, and asked what had happened, choosing a moment when we stepped out to the smoking area with cups of coffee from our vending machine. Roger shared with me what he had learned about his son's divorce and the reason for the divorce. But he still didn't seem to know who had painted Ed's face like that. And if he did, he didn't tell me. I told him that my family wasn't doing well either, and that in my opinion it happened to people because they didn't appreciate what they already had, because what they already had could be much more valuable than money or gold. Then, for some reason, I shared my preference for construction with him and told him what I would actually like to see there. I didn't think this idea would strike a chord with him. But instead of ignoring me, as he was promised a huge sum for the park, Roger asked me to elaborate further on my desire. While we smoked, I verbally described the project to him, and when we returned to the office, I even showed him the presumed layout on my laptop, which I had been working on at home in my spare time, just for myself. A week passed. I divorced Jody. I left her only with a one-room apartment that looked more like a homeless shelter, and I froze her bank account. Now she will have to get a job and earn money for herself. She cursed me for a long time for my actions but I wanted to punish her somehow for not valuing our relationship and betraying my love. And also, to my surprise, when I came to the office and prepared for another workday, a colleague approached me and said that the boss was in a frenzy. Then he explained that Roger Mordecai had decided to buy that plot of land and build a church there, as was appropriate. He wasn't particularly religious himself, he just thought it was the right thing to do and that it could somehow atone for his son's sins. The news of Roger's decision to build a church on the land took everyone by surprise. It was a stark contrast to the business deals and corporate decisions that had been the norm in our office. I couldn't help but wonder if this sudden change was connected to our conversation about appreciating what we already had and the value of doing something meaningful. As days turned into weeks, the plans for the church began to take shape. Roger was passionate about this project, pouring his energy and resources into it. He involved the entire office in various aspects of the planning, from the architecture to the landscaping. It was as if he had found a new purpose, one that went beyond the confines of the business world. During this time, I continued to focus on my own life. I threw myself into my work, and my career began to flourish. The divorce, painful as it had been, seemed like a necessary step towards a more fulfilling future. I found solace in knowing that I had taken a stand for what I believed in. One day, Roger called me into his office. He wanted to thank me for inspiring him to embark on this church project. He admitted that our conversation had made him reevaluate his priorities and the legacy he wanted to leave behind. It was a humbling moment, and I realized that sometimes, a simple conversation could have a profound impact on someone's life. Over the years, the church became a symbol of hope and redemption in our community. It served as a reminder that even in the midst of personal struggles and corporate ambitions, there was room for compassion and the pursuit of something greater. Roger and I developed a unique bond through our shared endeavor, one that transcended our roles in the office. We both learned that life had a way of surprising us, leading us down unexpected paths and teaching us valuable lessons about what truly mattered. Here's our second story in this video, enjoy it! Our house was located in a small town, it was quite spacious and cozy. Kristen and I had been living here for more than 20 years. We had a wonderful daughter who grew up to be a beauty, just like her mother, Jasmine, as her mother decided to name her. By this time, she had already finished school and was in her second year of college. However, the educational institution she chose for herself was in another state, and as much as my wife and I didn't want to let her go, she went her own way while Kristen and I continued our existence in our hometown, occasionally rejoicing when our daughter came home for holidays. I had my own job. I can't say I was a highly successful businessman. No, I was a mechanic. My father and grandfather were mechanics too, and I followed in their footsteps. 
But by this time, I already had my own workshop with various services, and it was thriving. I made sure to hire only the best mechanics. In the first few years of our life together, Kristen worked as a state psychologist in the hospital, but then she got tired of it. When she chose this profession, she somehow thought it would be like those movies where she sits in her office, and patients, sitting on a couch, would tell her about their fears and troubles. In reality, it was a bit different. Sometimes she dealt with women who just needed to talk, and they would tell her even the moments when they had to clean up the vomit of their alcoholic husbands. Other times, she had to extract information herself. However, most of the time, she was assigned to patients with complex illnesses, where Kristen simply offered words of support. Eventually, she grew tired of it and quit her job. For a while, she stayed at home and took care of the household. Then, one day, she came home all excited, and when I asked her what was going on, she said she had come up with something to do. At first, I thought she had found a regular job, but Christine replied that she had decided to start her own little business and tell people's fortunes, as well as allowing them to contact their deceased relatives. For some reason she had decided to get it into her head that she was a good psychic. She did have a great-grandmother who did something similar in her time, but I never believed in such things. I thought Kristen was doing it out of boredom. However, she sincerely believed that she had suddenly developed some abilities. She came home and told me that while crossing the street, something made her stop and it felt like someone touched her leg. She looked down and saw that the shoelace on her sneaker had come undone. As she bent down to tie it, a speeding car passed by. Whether it was just a reckless driver or there was something wrong with the car itself, she didn't know. But she was convinced that the untied shoelace saved her from a certain death or at least multiple fractures. On the other side of the street, she noticed a sign where someone was involved in various magical things. So, she decided to go there to find out what had happened to her. It seems that the person there fed her some story, and now she thinks she has some special abilities. I didn't try to dissuade her because it would be pointless. I let her pursue it so that she could convince herself that it was just a coincidence, and there was nothing supernatural about it. However, I didn't allow her to conduct any seances at home because I didn't want our house to turn into a thoroughfare. She rented a small house nearby and set it up for her future sessions. About two weeks later, everything was ready, and she placed ads in the newspaper and on local websites. When I entered the place, the atmosphere seemed somewhat mystical to me. Dim lighting, a round table in the center, various trinkets on the shelves, and she herself was adorned with cheap jewelry. Where's your crystal ball? I asked her sarcastically. Oh, what do you know about it? The ball has nothing to do with it. There are various methods to connect with spirits. I even have this special. She pulled out a Ouija board from under the table and placed it on the table. I found it a bit amusing, but at the same time slightly unsettling, as I had heard that messing around with such things could lead to trouble. However, I quickly reassured myself because, as I mentioned before, I didn't believe in anything like that. Over a year has passed since then. Yes, Kristen decided to pursue this when our daughter went away to college. I attributed her newfound interest to the loneliness she must have felt without our daughter. However, by the time I returned home from work in the evenings, Kristen was already home, having managed to prepare dinner and tidy up a bit. She didn't have many clients, and at first no one came at all. But she thought it was because she was just starting out and no one knew about her yet. But then this guy she'd been seeing since the shoelace thing started coming in a lot, and he seemed to have taught her a few things. And now she was just thrilled that she could do something like that. However, the main events of my story began a couple of months ago. I started noticing that some things in our house were not in their places in the morning, and sometimes things even went missing. I decided to discuss it with my wife, assuming she quietly took something to sell for funds to acquire new artifacts for her activities. But she vehemently denied everything and even accused me of not trusting her. A couple of days later, when it happened again, and I noticed that my precious silver cigarette case, inherited from my grandfather and kept in my study as a memento, was missing, I decided to get to the bottom of it once and for all. I sat my wife down again and interrogated her. This is going too far. You know how much this item meant to me. If you needed money for your nonsense, couldn't you just tell me? I didn't take it. Do I need your cigarette case? 
How dare you accuse me of such? We've been together for so many years, and you think I'm capable of this? Then someone must have been in the house. Tell me, whom did you invite? Your friends don't usually behave like this. So, did you bring someone else in? Is your place for a little seance not enough, so you decided to engage in this nonsense at home? We argued for some time, and then she suddenly fell silent, her face frozen in horror. I think I know what's happening, she whispered with a trembling voice. Oh? What is it? Speak up, because I'm calling the police. No. The police won't help here. The thing is, she looked at me as if she had seen a ghost. A few days ago, an elderly lady came to me. She was strange, wanted to contact her grandfather, who, according to her, was a noble sorcerer. Well, I started the session as usual, even applied all my tricks for authenticity. But then something went wrong. I swear to you, something actually appeared in the room, and I felt a chill on my spine like never before. I got really scared. It seemed like the spirit was angry that it had been disturbed. I decided to end the session, but I think the spirit never returned to its realm. What? I felt that all this was starting to annoy me. Do you even hear what you're saying? What spirit? Are you smoking something there or what? Probably, your herbs have affected you. Tell me directly, where are my things disappearing to? But Kristen insisted on her story, repeatedly blaming the spirit, and it seemed to me that her mind was affected by her activities. Listen, Kristen, maybe you should consult a specialist? It seems you're taking all this too close to heart. What? Do you think I need a psychiatrist? Don't forget, I worked as a psychologist for so many years, and I can distinguish hallucinations from reality. You just don't believe me because you weren't there at that time. And Harry says it's true. Ah, Harry. I interrupted her when she remembered the guy who was actually the cause of all this. I always considered him and people like him charlatans who took advantage of people's trust and lured money from them. Harry, right? Maybe he orchestrated all of this. Did you ever think about that? No. You can't be serious. He couldn't. After all, he taught me so much and helped me a lot. How dare you accuse him of this? I realized that nothing sensible would come out of this conversation. My wife continued to stand her ground, and I was tired of arguing with her senselessly. I left her in the kitchen with her delusional fantasy and went to my study to pour myself a drink because now I needed to calm down as well. While contemplating the recent events in my study, I thought to myself that if her delusions didn't stop, I would forcibly take her to a psychiatrist because it had crossed all boundaries. But besides that, I still needed to figure out where things were disappearing from the house. Knowing that my wife wouldn't confess, I decided to buy a few small cameras. The next day, I proceeded with my plan. Secretly from my wife, I hung miniature cameras, disguising them as various household items throughout the house, excluding the bathrooms. I hoped this way I could catch the thief, whoever it might be, and find out what was happening in the house recently. The next morning, I overslept a bit and didn't have a chance to check what was wrong in the house. Only returning from work, I began inspecting the house. I intentionally sent my wife to the store under the pretext of buying something for dinner while I started the investigation. As I suspected, something was missing from the house again and items on the kitchen shelves were rearranged in a chaotic order. I settled behind my computer and started reviewing the camera footage. They recorded only when there was movement, which saved a lot of time. When I checked, I noticed there was movement during the night. It seemed a little strange to me, although I thought maybe the wife was just getting up for a drink of water. But the time of movement showed that someone was moving around in the house much longer than it took to get a drink. So I started looking. What I saw left me perplexed. I saw Kristen leaving the bedroom, then wandering around the house, including the kitchen. Later, she started rearranging some things herself and even took some items off the shelves, carrying them into the basement. Could my wife have become a sleepwalker? But I had never noticed such signs before. I started researching online to find out if such cases occurred, as I always believed it was a hereditary disease. After searching, I read that such cases could happen due to stress, lack of sleep, or extreme fatigue. I also found several other possible causes of sleepwalking. 
However, I hadn't observed any of these signs in my wife before. She always seemed quite energetic and never complained about fatigue or depression. Although she might have been deeply concerned about her new endeavor, leading to this situation. Just to be sure, I found a psychiatrist's number and consulted with him over the phone. He confirmed my suspicions and advised either for her to stop everything or for me to provide emotional support, agreeing with her and encouraging her. For me, it was important to get my wife back to normal, so I decided to overcome myself and pretend to believe in all her abilities. I even agreed to participate in one of her sessions. While contemplating this, my gaze returned to the monitor. I noticed yellow stripes on the player, indicating that someone had been in the house during the day. Trying to comfort myself with the thought that my wife was just busy, I still decided to review the recording. Indeed, it was Kristen. She was at home at a time when she usually worked in her office. Initially, she was alone, but then another person appeared. I recognized him as Harry. But what was he doing in our house? I explicitly told my wife that there should be no strangers in our house, especially the charlatan. However, what I saw next shattered all my previous assumptions. Harry seated her on the couch, placed a dark piece of fabric on her head, and then waved his hands over her, whispering something. It didn't last long, just a couple of minutes. Then he removed the cloth and sat next to her. They didn't speak. I was simply shocked by what I saw. Her? In my house? With this scumbag? Damn it! And she tried to convince me. So, this was the evil spirit she talked about. There he was, in the flesh. When they finished and Kristen left the room, I noticed how he reached for a small porcelain figurine on the shelf and managed to hide it in his bag before Kristen returned to the room. In that moment, I was instantly filled with anger and disappointment. I stood frozen in front of that monitor, and various insane thoughts swirled in my head. I wanted to send him and her to their spirits. I even started to imagine what I would do to them when a knock on the door broke me from my thoughts. At first, I thought it was Kristen who forgot her keys and was now knocking for me to let her in. Filled with rage, I headed towards the door, ready to unleash my anger on her the moment I opened it. But as soon as I opened the door, I saw the neighbor on the threshold. She stood there with a frightened face, demanding to see Kristen. What happened? She's not here right now. Why do you need her? I asked. Oh, Matt, don't ask. I urgently need her to contact my late husband. Strange things are happening at home sometimes, Stephanie replied. Let me guess. Things are disappearing? I interrupted. What? What things? No. But something strange is happening at home. I'm not that old yet. I don't want to die, Stephanie started to panic. At that moment, my wife appeared behind her with a bag in her hands. When she greeted the neighbor, Stephanie screamed in surprise. Here's our medium, I muttered. I didn't want to have a family fight in front of the neighbor, so I decided to postpone it until my wife and I were alone. Stephanie, seeing Christine behind her, calmed down a little and then went to her with problem. It was too late to go to the house where she usually received clients, so Christine decided to invite her neighbor to our house. They went into the kitchen, and I sat down on the couch, so that I could hear when Stephanie left, but I could hear their conversation too, even though my wife covered the door, the neighbor was just talking too loudly, because she was emotional. Kristen, help me, Stephanie began. It seems my husband wants to take me. And I'm still so young. Tonight he appeared in my dream, calling me with him. And then our dog, whom he loved so much, disappeared somewhere. I called him, searched everywhere, but couldn't find him. It's like he vanished into thin air. I think my husband took him. But that's not all. Half an hour ago, when I was cleaning in the bedroom, his portrait fell and the glass shattered into tiny pieces. Kristen, please talk to him. It's too early for me to go there, right? Please. Then Stephanie fell silent, and my wife spoke, but I couldn't make out what exactly because she spoke in a hushed voice. After that, Stephanie's cries resumed, and I had had enough. I jerked my fifth place off the couch and went over to them. That's enough of this nonsense. Stephanie, it's time for you to go home, I shouted. But what about my problem? She asked. Talk tomorrow. 
maybe. I took her by the hand and led her to the door. Stephanie didn't resist, apparently, she understood that her visit to us was untimely. And when she was already behind the door, I returned to my wife. This is just some kind of nightmare. Can you imagine a ghost of her husband? Kristen began. What the hell nightmare? What the hell ghost? Let me tell you what kind of ghost it is. Her dog was already old. That's why he went to find a place to die. Animals usually do that. And she probably bumped into the portrait herself. She said she was cleaning. As for her dream, you saw that it's only been two months since the funeral and she's already having an affair. She's scared and nervous, and that's what she dreams about. That's it. Enough. And, by the way, I didn't want to talk to you about this, I continued. Really? What about, she asked with some interest. But instead of an answer, I gave her a hard slap that made her stagger, and then she tripped over a chair, crashing to the floor. About what, said I afterward. About your own ghost. I saw you an idiot. Idiot, right in our living room. Are you out of your mind? Matt. No. That's not what dash she started, trying to get up off the floor, but I was so furious I kicked her in the shoulder and she was sprawled out on the floor again. But at some point, I realized that by such actions, I could not only harm her but also kill her, although somewhere deep down, I wanted that. Nevertheless, I stepped back a little and she managed to get up and sit on a chair. But her face showed fear, and it even seemed to me that she was about to cry. However, tears never appeared in her eyes. Matt. Let me explain everything to you, she began, but I remained silent and just stared at her. This is not what you think. It was a ritual. What? What the hell ritual? Do you remember I told you that an evil spirit remained in our world? So, Harry found out that it got attached to me and that's why strange things are happening in our house. And Harry just wants to detach it from me in this way. I didn't know what to think anymore. But I knew for sure that by my wife Madhouse is crying. All this shit she's been doing has definitely damaged her psyche. Are you completely insane? What the hell spirit? Are you making a fool out of me? This man is just using you. Moreover, he's stealing from us. It's all recorded on camera. And you, damn society girl. I approached her again and raised my hand, but Kristen shrank in place and trembled with fear. I lowered my hand. As much as I wanted to beat all this nonsense out of her, I understood that it wouldn't help, and I could even face legal consequences for domestic violence. So, I just grabbed her, dragged her into the bedroom. After that, I called the psychiatric clinic and described my wife's symptoms, asking them to come and take her for involuntary treatment. I didn't have to wait long for them. Soon, the doctors were in our bedroom, and one of them conducted a peculiar examination. However, instead of pretending to be normal, Kristen continued to express her beliefs that something ominous was haunting her, and if she didn't finish the ritual, it would take her away. Kristen was taken to the hospital. I didn't go with them, even though the doctor said I needed to fill out some papers. I said I would do it the next day. At that moment, I felt so bad and disgusted that I just wanted to drink and try to forget all the madness that happened that evening. Alone, I did just that. Sitting in my office, I poured myself whiskey and closed my eyes for a moment. But I couldn't relax. Opening my eyes again, I saw the same monitor with that infamous video. And I realized that I had another unfinished business. I needed to settle the score with the scoundrel who took advantage of my wife's trust and naivety, gradually robbing us. I looked up the website where his office was located and headed there. But it was already closed. It wasn't surprising since it was late. I felt a certain disappointment that at this moment, he wouldn't fall into my hands and wouldn't feel my anger. Not knowing what to do at that moment and where to find that stupid, I approached a nearby night kiosk, bought a bottle of whiskey, and sat on one of the benches in a small square to peacefully drown my soul in alcohol. As soon as I took a few sips, a homeless man, all scruffy and in rags, approached me. But before sitting on the bench, he asked for permission. Such politeness seemed strange to me, but I allowed him to sit beside me. Thank you. Do you happen to have a dollar so I can buy something to eat? He asked. 
I understood that it was a regular begging, but I didn't want to argue with him, so I reached into my pocket. I had a $20 bill, and I handed it to him. He sincerely thanked me, and after a short pause, he continued. I see you're a kind person. Can I ask for a couple of sips of your drink? Don't think I'm an alcoholic. Sometimes it gets cold at night, and I just want to warm up. Now I was completely sure that he was just a regular beggar. Nevertheless, I handed him the entire bottle. The man took it, then rummaged in his pocket and pulled out a small cup. He poured himself a little and handed the rest back to me. Just a little for me. To warm up, he murmured. Are you upset about something? He asked when I took the bottle back and took another sip. Yes. Looking for someone. But I don't know where he is. And I need to find him urgently. Not that charlatan, the homeless man asked, nodding towards Harry's office. Yes. Him. How did you know? Saw you hanging around his door. But, you know, for your kindness, I'll tell you where he lives. I can see somehow upset you. He did the same to me. I used to be a normal person, had a home, a wife, and a job. And when I started going to his sessions, he just stripped me bare. And now I'm here. The homeless man told me in detail where the scoundrel's house was, and I didn't wait any longer. I headed in that direction. When you meet him, give him a kick from me, the man requested as a farewell. I didn't have to search for the scumbag for long. He lived just a few blocks away from his office. When I rang the doorbell and he opened it, he wanted to close it immediately upon seeing me. I immediately kicked the door with my foot, and Harry flew aside after such a push. I didn't bother explaining the reasons for my visit, I felt like he understood everything. I just pounced on him, knocked him to the floor, and started beating his face until it was completely covered in blood, and a tooth fell out of his mouth. Only then did I step back a bit, looking at his battered body. Harry curled up in pain and fear, still afraid to say anything. Then I looked around a bit and saw that his living space wasn't that large, it was a small apartment, more like a huge room divided into kitchen and bedroom areas by mesh partitions. And in the middle, on the couch, sat some girl, watching what was happening with fear. And who are you? I asked. Also came for his sessions? Come on, get out of here. We're having a serious conversation. I actually live here, she said quietly. I'm his wife. Oh, a wife. Do you know what your husband is up to? How he sleeps with other men's wives and steals from people. I said in anger. What? She seemed confused by what she heard. I don't know how they lived before this, and what kind of nonsense he fed her, but it seemed like I opened her eyes to his schemes. The girl got furious herself and started attacking her husband, first verbally, and then throwing various things at him, including some items I recognized as mine. While they were having their quarrel, I walked a bit further into the room to the shelves, where I saw my cigarette case. Without hesitation, I took it and headed for the exit. By that time, Harry had already gotten up, and I grabbed him by the collar again, pushing him against the wall. It's not over with you. I'll report you to the police, and you'll answer for all your schemes, I said and hit him in the face again. After that, I intended to leave, giving his wife the chance to do the rest of the dirty work for me. But as I took a step, I stopped. Harry, in the meantime, wanted to return to the room. Oh, by the way, almost forgot. Someone asked me to send regards. I pushed him to the floor, and as he fell on all fours, I kicked him in the rear with the toe of my shoe. I don't know exactly where I hit, but he screamed like a woman, curled up in pain, and I left his house with a smirk on my face. The next day, as planned, I took the flash drive with the recording and went to the police station. But I didn't go alone. I found that homeless man I saw the day before and thought that he also had the right to tell his story to the police, thereby testifying that Harry was involved in deception and fraud. Soon I learned from the news that the police managed to arrest Harry, and after some investigation, they found out that I wasn't the only one deceived by him. I was glad that he could no longer continue his business and deceive people. Moreover, I decided that my wife would never engage in such activities again. I went to her office, ordered a large garbage truck, and hired a few guys who helped me load all the junk into the truck. 
Some of them asked for permission to keep some items they liked, and I didn't object, only asking them not to use them for any sinister purposes. As for the Ouija board, which Kristen cherished so much, I burned it in the backyard, hoping it would cause no harm to anyone else. About a month has passed since then. I sometimes visited my wife to inquire about her condition and how the treatment was going. To my surprise, she did not get better. On the contrary, the doctors had to put her in a straitjacket because she was attempting to strangle herself. Her fantasies about some spirit became even stronger. I didn't understand why all this happened to her since there were no traumatic incidents in her life that could have such an impact on her. Nevertheless, life went on. I had to go to work, and the only unpleasant thing was when my daughter called, and I had to tell her that her mom was seriously ill. I didn't tell her about Kristen's infidelity, but I decided for myself that as soon as she recovered, I would file for divorce and let her go to hell. A few days later, just as I was getting back on track, I received a disturbing call from the doctor. He said my wife had passed away, but her death seemed strange to them. He didn't provide details over the phone, only asking me to come. They led me into a room where her body lay covered with a sheet. The doctor even offered me a drink, saying that what I was about to see might shock me. But what could surprise me more than her betrayal? The doctor lifted the sheet, revealing her face. Seeing it, I regretted not following the doctor's advice. It's impossible to describe the expression on her face. The doctor said she had suffered a heart attack from something that scared her severely. Indeed, her face showed an intense fear. Such an expression reminded me of a scene from the movie The Ring. I immediately turned away, and in front of me was a glass with alcohol that the doctor had handed me. I refused and went home. At home, I tried to console myself by thinking that Kristen had just immersed herself so deeply in her fantasies that she mistook them for reality. Seeing various horrifying things, she had imagined that some monster had consumed her. But her face still lingered in my mind and I had to drink quite a bit of alcohol to forget even a little. And when I collapsed into the armchair in the evening, it seemed like there was something else in the room. I started scrutinizing the dark corners, and it seemed. No, I was sure that something was there, slowly creeping towards me. And then everything suddenly began to shake. At first slightly, then more and more, and items on the shelves literally started jumping. The chair I was sitting in also began to sway and the chandelier above me seemed about to fall on me. I suddenly felt so frightened, simply to shit. I immediately dropped the glass, and as soon as I could, I rushed out of that cursed house onto the street. For a moment, it even seemed to me that my wife was right about the spirits, and now she had come for me. I seemed to start believing in it. But when I found myself outside, the shaking stopped. I heard people around me who had also rushed out onto the street. A neighbor who was closer to me than anyone else, approached and said that it was probably an earthquake, quite a strong one in his opinion. Our city had never experienced such a thing before, but the mountains were not far from us, and the behavior of nature could sometimes be unpredictable. The explanation from the neighbor reassured me. However, since then, I no longer drank, and moreover, the next day, I sold our house and moved to a completely different neighborhood. I can't say that I believed in anything supernatural, but for some reason, staying in that house terrified me. Here's our third story in this video, enjoy it! Approximately three years ago, my brother George fell seriously ill. He needed urgent surgery, and he was living paycheck to paycheck. Now, all hope rested on me. However, I didn't have enough savings either. I talked to my wife, and we agreed to sell our fairly large house, downsizing to something more modest. The proceeds would cover the cost of the surgery and subsequent treatment. We didn't need much with our children grown and leading their own lives. And at the time, I was more concerned about my brother's health than the thickness of my wallet and the size of my rooms. The surgery was successful and I was relieved that George was recovering. However, soon after, I faced another setback, I lost my job due to circumstances beyond my control. For a couple of months, we had to tighten our belts, relying solely on my wife's income as she worked as a janitor in a nursing home. But I wasn't going to sit idle, and every day I was busy looking for a normal job, and then even just at least some work. I came across job opportunities that seemed decent, but something always went wrong, leading me to change jobs a few times in two years. Then, 
I managed to secure a position as a night watchman at the city museum. After about a month, I realized it was a good fit for me, and I decided to stay. I wasn't a savvy businessman or a slick ad agent. For many years after military service, I worked in a security agency. However, about five years ago, I injured my leg, and they shifted me to desk work. But the pay wasn't bad. And when a new boss came and reviewed the staff, he felt that they no longer needed my services. Now, I've been working at the museum for about a year, and I even enjoy it. I know my job well, and the pay is decent. Not as much as I would like, but it was enough for us to get by and occasionally treat ourselves to some leisure. The only drawback was that I saw my wife less frequently. I worked at night, and she had day shifts. But weekends were usually the only time we had together. Once again, when I returned from work on a Saturday morning, relaxing and scratching my belly, lying in a chair in front of the TV and drinking beer, Emma came into the room and nervously threw a small bag of groceries on the table. I've had enough of this, she muttered. What happened, Emma? More trouble at work? It's not just work. I'm tired of all this. She gestured around. Our life now. Is this even a life? Cramped rooms, only one car. And us? We only see each other in the mornings or evenings. I leave, and you come. I come, and you leave. We hardly even have a night. Can't you find a decent job? She sat in another chair and let out a loud sigh, vending her frustration. In moments like these, when she complained, I was almost glad that we saw each other less. But on the other hand, I understood she was right, realizing that I missed her too lately. I didn't want to argue with her, so I found tender words to calm her down. Then I suggested going for a walk in the park or along the waterfront, even though I desperately wanted to sleep after my shift. But I also wanted to do something nice for her. However, Emma declined, grumbling a bit more about the kind of life we had fallen into, and went to the kitchen to prepare lunch. I took advantage of her disinterest in spending time with me and went to sleep. Towards the evening, when I woke up but the sun hadn't set yet, I sat back in my favorite chair, with nothing much to do. However, when I turned on the TV, I didn't pay much attention to what was on. I remembered the morning conversation with my wife, and I couldn't help but contemplate it. Yes, I liked the quiet, peaceful job where almost nothing happened, but at the same time, I realized that our feelings, Emma's and mine, were slowly fading. It could be a consequence of our age, not too old, but certainly not too young. Yet, I recalled those times in our life when we laughed, played, and rejoiced together. I didn't want that to disappear from our lives forever. While I pondered that it was indeed time for me to consider changing jobs, my friend Roger called. He knew I had another day off and invited me to have a beer with him. Emma was sitting in the bedroom on the bed, reading a book when I entered and told her I would meet up with a friend. She didn't respond, just waved her hand without looking at me, and focused her attention back on the book. Roger seemed a bit agitated when I found him at the bar, and he was already a bit tipsy. I sat down next to him and asked if something had happened. Yeah, just had a fight with the wife. She suspects me of cheating. Can you believe it? Me? She's probably having an affair with someone else, and now she's just trying to get off on me so I won't find out she's cheating. Oh, that's sad. Did you really do nothing? I asked, knowing that sometimes he did enjoy admiring the legs of attractive women. No, man. Seriously? Do you think I would betray my wife? He asked, offended. Sorry. You're right. But why are you so sure she's cheating on you? She's changed lately. Acting nervously around me, always trying to start an argument. And she started dressing up, going to work as if it's a date. Damn, if I catch her, I'll kill that idiot. Both her and him. I felt sorry for my friend. I don't know what I myself would do in his shoes. I couldn't even imagine myself in that situation. I tried to cheer him up as best as I could, then smoothly shifted the conversation to another topic, hoping to lighten his dark thoughts. Among other things, I shared with him the thought that I was considering changing jobs again. However, for some reason, Roger started discouraging me saying that it was a perfectly normal job considering my not-so-healthy knee, and I didn't have to run around or deal with other issues there. 
a quiet and decently paying job that he wouldn't mind having himself. However, he already had a cozy spot in the office and was used to it. I returned home, thinking that the conversation with my friend was more empty than our usual gatherings. It even seemed to me that he had changed somehow. As if something weighed on him, but he didn't tell me anything about it. Yes, his suspicions about his wife's infidelity could be the reason for his behavior, but I felt that there was more, and he was saddened by something else. Emma was already asleep, the book dropped carelessly on her chest when I entered the bedroom. I gently took her reading material and adjusted part of her blanket. Then, her book caught my attention, specifically its title, How to Regain Youth at 40. I didn't pay much attention to it at the time, thinking that Emma simply didn't want to acknowledge her real age and, like all women, wanted to look good. A few days later, after returning a bit tired from another night shift, I again contemplated the idea of searching for something else. For a few days, I had pushed it aside, considering my friend's advice and hoping that everything would work out. But lately, I began to notice that it was getting harder for me to handle night shifts. Despite feeling sleepy, I took a shower, changed clothes, and sat down at the laptop to browse job vacancies in our city again. Emma was about to leave for work. She dryly told me that there was food on the stove, then simply left without even kissing me goodbye, as usual. Noticing this, I thought that she was upset about something again, but this time, she didn't say anything to me. However, I didn't detain her and continued scrolling through the website. Later on, my eyelids began to feel heavy, and I decided it was time to go to bed. Coming into the bedroom, I absentmindedly adjusted the blanket and noticed a piece of clothing sticking out from under the bed. I pulled it out and saw that it was a men's shirt in a large checkered pattern. It definitely wasn't mine, I never wore clothes with any patterns. Then, I remembered Roger's words about suspecting his wife of cheating, listing several arguments. Also, Emma's changing mood lately and her book, Teaching How to Be Charming. Could it be that Emma, too, decided to tread this sinful path? To clear everything up, I wanted to call her and ask why there was someone else's clothing in her bedroom, especially under the bed. But her mobile didn't answer, and when I called her work phone, her colleague said that Emma was currently attending to one of the elderly residents. Thinking that I would call her a bit later, I sat in the armchair and turned on the TV. Opening my eyes, I noticed that the sun had already shifted significantly and was gradually heading towards the horizon. Apparently, I had just fallen asleep while waiting for the time. Glancing at the clock, I saw that Emma was about to return from work. In my hand, I continued to hold the shirt, gripping it tightly with my fingers, not letting go even in my sleep. Soon enough, Emma indeed entered the house, and she seemed to be in a slightly uplifted mood. I didn't beat around the bush and immediately met her, waving the shirt in front of her. Emma. Tell me, what is this? This? It looks like a shirt, she calmly replied. I can see it's a shirt. Whose is it? And what was it doing in our bedroom? Her nonchalant and indifferent response irritated me a bit, and I raised my tone. Why are you yelling? She snatched the shirt from me and started inspecting it carefully. Hell knows. Maybe it's yours? Are you making an idiot out of me? You know I don't wear something like that. And do you think I don't know my own clothes? She made a slightly pensive face, as if recalling past events, and then calmly responded, maybe the electrician forgot it. What the hell, electrician? I was getting frustrated. A few days ago, I called an electrician. There was an issue with the lamp closer tonight. I couldn't sit in the dark. And you were at work. So, I... I found it in the bedroom. What was it doing there? Exactly in the bedroom, the light bulb went out. Damn, you're so annoying. I was in a good mood, and you managed to ruin it, she began to grumble again. I didn't know what to say in response. Perhaps everything was as she said. But doubts still lingered in me. However, at that moment, I had nothing to grasp onto, and I just let go of the topic. Deep down, I still hoped that my emerging jealousy and suspicions of her infidelity were baseless. The next day, after my shift, I waited for the time when my boss would come and went to his office. I honestly told him that night shifts had become difficult for me lately and asked if there was a possibility to work during the day. As a last resort, 
I told him that if nothing worked out, then just settle my account. I understood that for some time, I would have to rely on my wife again, but there was no other way. Fortunately, the boss didn't object to my request. He said he would think about what could be done but asked me to work a couple more nights while he found a replacement. I agreed and headed home, hoping that things would change for the better in the near future. When I pulled onto our street, I saw that there were repairmen working on the electric poles, and the signs on the stores and the traffic lights were not lit. I stopped and asked a man who was standing on the sidewalk watching what was going on here. He replied that during the night, when there was a thunderstorm, lightning apparently damaged the transformer and until then the whole street was without electricity. But then he added that the repair service has been working for some time and everything should be back to normal soon. I went home, thinking that by this time, my wife should have already left for work. After all, I had delayed at work myself, and there was no time left for our short meeting. Unaware of anything, I calmly entered the house, immediately took a beer can from the fridge out of habit, and drank it right away for mood. Then I headed to the bedroom to take a shower and go to bed. Entering the room, I was stunned by what I saw. Emma was still asleep on the bed, and next to her, on my side of the bed, Roger was sprawled out, snoring quietly. Our electric alarm clock on the nightstand wasn't working due to the lack of electricity, and obviously, these idiots overslept the moment when it was time to get up. At that moment I felt a sudden surge of anger and rage. That idiot Roger, who had called me his friend, and who had just recently sworn that he would never cheat on his wife, was now lying on my bed. Now I understood why he had tried so hard to talk me out of quitting my job. It was quite convenient for him. While I was on shift, he was having fun with my wife and trying to make his wife look guilty. Now I realized what he hadn't told me that night when we had our last drink. But why had he talked to me about cheating? Maybe he was trying to convince me of his innocence beforehand, so that I wouldn't suspect anything? All these thoughts went through my head in a flash. And then I gave in to my rage and was about to lash out at them. Just then, the power came back on and our alarm clock beeped loudly, as it does when it's reset. Emma and Roger were instantly awakened by the loud sound of the alarm clock and my screaming, with which I was already leaping towards them. At that moment, I wanted to tear both of them apart. I grabbed Roger by the leg and yanked him off the bed in one swift motion. When he ended up on the floor, tangled in the sheets, I started pounding him with my fists, not even thinking about where the blows landed. Emma began to scream in fright, but still rushed towards me, trying to pull me away from Roger. At that moment, I caught her with my elbow, hitting her in the face, and she recoiled towards the bed. For a moment, I turned to her to see what had happened. Somehow, Roger managed to free himself and immediately shoved me hard, then struck my sore knee. He was a couple of years younger than me and healthier. He quickly regained his composure while I grabbed my injured leg, and, grabbing his pants on the way, he dashed towards the door. Come back, you an idiot. We're not done, I shouted after him, but it seemed he had no intention of lingering in my house. When I realized he had escaped like a coward, I turned to my wife who was still sitting near the bed, leaning her cheek on her palm. She clearly saw the rage in my eyes and pressed against the bed even harder, expecting that I would now start hitting her. At some point, I even wanted to do just that. I grabbed her by the arm, pushed her towards the door with such force that she fell and sprawled on the floor. You wretch, I hissed. How dare you? In our damn home. Does this look like a house to you? Suddenly she started snapping at me. You said it's all temporary. That we will live as before. But you can't even find a decent job. I'm tired of living like this. You traded everything for your brother. He could have been placed in a regular clinic. His illness wasn't that severe. Her words angered me even more. How could this slut blame everything on my brother? I approached her again grabbed her by the hair, and pushed her face into the floor. Shut up, stupid. How dare you say that? Did you climb into bed with Roger for money? I asked her, lifting her head from the floor. I wanted to push her again when the phone rang. The answering machine kicked in, and after the beep, a female voice was heard. It was her colleague, inquiring why Emma hadn't shown up for work yet. I looked at my wife's bloodied face with a bruise already forming on her cheek, and realized that in my fit of anger, I could kill her right there. 
I was furious, disappointed, and the pain from her actions was intense, but I wasn't a murderer. I simply pushed her, then stepped over her and left the bedroom. I didn't want to stay in that house any longer, not for a minute. Besides, the drowsiness was gone as if lifted by hand. I quickly left the house, grabbing only my jacket, and headed to the car. But where could I go now? I considered the house already lost, as I couldn't bear to return there. I had no friend anymore. I could have gone looking for him to finish what I'd started, but he could have been anywhere. So I called my brother and went to see him. He was about to leave for work, but upon hearing my sad voice, he delayed. I didn't hide anything from him, told him what had happened in my family. He listened to me and suggested we have a drink. Don't you need to go to work? Suddenly, I realized I was holding him back. No. It's okay. I called and said I'll be later. You're my brother. How can I leave you like this? His support was very comforting, much needed at that moment. Later, I asked him if I could stay at his place for a few days, and he didn't object at all. He even gave me a spare key to his house, adding that I could stay as long as I needed. But in reality, I didn't want to burden him with my presence for long. I just needed to settle work matters and find some place for myself. After pouring my heart out to my brother, I felt that sleep was trying to take hold of my body again. George suggested I lie down in his bedroom, but I settled on the sofa, which seemed very comfortable to me. After completing two more night shifts, I was once again left without a job, as my boss couldn't find anything suitable for me. But it was good for me for the time being, as I could finally get a good rest first, and then focus on finding Roger. Of course, I could just call his wife and tell her everything, giving her the opportunity to take revenge for me. But I wanted to deal with him myself. When I felt more energized, I set out to find him. He wasn't at home, and at work, they said he had gone on a business trip. It seemed I would have to wait for some time until he returned to the city. But then I remembered that one of my former colleagues was also a skilled computer guy. I knew he was capable of various tricks, and I hoped he could help me. I went to him with a request to track Roger's phone, and he was also able to install a special program on his phone so that I could monitor his movements later. Steve a young and remarkably talented guy for his age, fortunately agreed to help me, as we had always had good relations. As soon as he launched his program on the computer, I was extremely surprised by the result, because Roger was in town. Moreover, his location indicated that he was currently in my house. I felt even more rage at the audacity of this scoundrel, continuing to come to my wife in my house. And this chicken hadn't even attempted to call me or talk, let alone apologize. Apparently, this man had truly become so dear to her that she decided to trade me for him. I was angry and desperate that my life had turned out this way. I vaguely remembered my wife's words that it all started when I helped my brother. But I could not help him. He's my brother, and I'm sure he would have done the same in my place. Besides, he remained my only family. But it wasn't the time to cry over spilled milk. I pulled myself together, confident that I would surely handle everything and survive this sad period in my life. Besides, I had a more important task at hand, and I headed to my home. Glancing at the phone screen to see if Roger was still there, I made my way to the address where I used to live. Opening the door with my foot, filled with rage, I headed towards the bedroom, glancing into each room along the way. And I was right. Those idiots were there again, writhing under the covers. I even wondered why Emma wasn't at work and then remembered that today was a day off. Seeing me, they immediately stopped their activity and Emma started angrily scolding me, continuing to accuse me of not being able to provide her with a decent life anymore and questioning why the hell I returned if I left home. Her brazen speech angered me even more and Roger, meanwhile, jumped out of bed, seemingly intent on attacking me himself, regardless of the fact that he was without anything. He managed to clumsily wrap himself in a sheet and then lunged at me. We clashed again. At that moment, I was ready for anything. I wanted to send both idiots straight to hell. I was even willing to go to jail afterward, as my life had already gone to hell, just to punish these idiots for such low betrayal. Roger and I exchanged blows with all our might, and neither of us was willing to give up. This time, Emma didn't dare to try to separate us again and remained sitting in the corner of the bed, wrapped in a blanket. The room had turned into a warehouse of scattered items and some broken furniture. 
Eventually, I began to feel myself getting exhausted. Roger, noticing this, took advantage of the situation and delivered a decisive blow to my jaw, almost knocking me unconscious. I leaned against the floor, trying to come to my senses again, while Roger stood over me with a triumphant look and spoke. What are you raging about? She doesn't love you anymore. You can't give her anything anymore, but she's happy with me. Just let her go, he said, starting to get dressed. I didn't bother to attack him further because besides being almost powerless, I realized that I wouldn't get my wife back anyway. She made her choice, and I suddenly realized that neither of them was worth me serving a sentence for their murder. Besides, what would my children say afterward? How could I look them in the eye? With that thought, I got up and limped toward the exit, casting only a furious glance at my wife and then at Roger. Beaten down, I returned to my brother's house. I needed to tend to some of my wounds, and besides, I really wanted a drink. In the evening, George returned positively beaming with some joyful news. I was about to ask him what had made him so happy, but he beat me to it, seeing my condition, and immediately bombarded me with questions about what had happened to me. I told him everything as it was, and then finally asked him my question. After sincerely sympathizing with me, my brother finally confessed why he was in such a good mood. It turns out, every day for the past few months during his lunch break, he had been buying a lottery ticket at the cafe where he grabbed lunch and coffee. And on this day, luck finally smiled on him, and he hit the jackpot. I sincerely rejoiced for him, but at the same time, I couldn't shake the thoughts of what to do next. And as if reading my mind, my brother solemnly announced that he had decided to give me half of the winnings without any conditions, and furthermore, he was now planning to buy me a house where I could live. I didn't know what to say to him. He explained that I had helped him immensely in the past, as without me, he might not even be here now. He clearly understood what sacrifices I had to make for him, and now he was ready to repay me for my care. Some time passed. I heard the news that Roger's wife eventually found out about his infidelity. Besides causing a scene, she filed for divorce. According to the terms of their marital contract, Roger was left with nothing since he was the one who cheated. I was even glad that fate turned away from him, and now he lived in a rented apartment, trying to find a decent job, as his wife had taken care to ensure he was fired from his previous position. Emma, after learning that Roger was now penniless, broke up with him and continued her existence by changing sheets for old people and taking care of ducks for them. I understood that this woman had always loved only money, and she was with me only for that reason. And I was even glad to be rid of her, as I needed a woman who would love me, be my friend, and support me in any situation. Besides, I wasn't going to just sit around. Even though I had received a considerable sum from my brother, I kept looking for a job. And suddenly I happened to come across an ad for a vacancy for a department head in a security agency at my previous job. Apparently, the new head did not meet all the expectations of the general director, but I did not bother to look into it. I just called the number, although I didn't expect to be hired. However, the director agreed to take me back because he had heard about my skills and experience. For some time now, I had been working in my new position. One day, when I was about to meet with a client, passing through the cafe, I accidentally saw Roger. During the time we hadn't seen each other, he had changed his appearance, grown a beard, stopped cutting his hair, and his eyes were empty and lifeless. He was cleaning up the food spilled by a customer and didn't immediately notice me when I stopped in front of him. When he realized that someone standing in front of him wasn't going to bypass him, he looked up. You, he was even surprised to see me in a good suit and in high spirits. Oh, Roger. I see you found yourself a new job? Yeah, I'm just helping out an acquaintance here. He seemed embarrassed that he worked as a simple cleaner in this cafe and tried to present himself in a better light. At that moment, the bartender called him, saying that they also needed to clean up in the restroom, as someone felt unwell there. I found it amusing that he ended up in such a situation and considered that he deserved it. However, I didn't mock him, especially since I was in a bit of a hurry for my meeting, so I just left him in an embarrassed state. On the way back, after sorting out everything with the client, I saw Roger smoking near the cafe entrance. I decided to talk to him after all. Listen, Roger. I'm even glad that you opened my eyes to Emma, I said, approaching him. After all, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have known that her feelings towards me were fake. 
But I still don't understand. Why you? Why did she cheat on me with you? There were wealthier men around than you. Before answering, Roger sighed heavily. I loved her. I've loved her for a long time, ever since you and I became friends. But I saw that you both were happy, and when you had financial troubles, I thought I could try my luck. We just happened to meet, and she told me she no longer loved you and intended to divorce you. I decided to take the chance. I thought she had fallen in love with me because she was so confident in conveying that. Oh, you simpleton. And you thought you could pull everything off behind my back? You could have just come to me and talked. I could have. But we slept together that same evening, and I felt too ashamed to look you in the eye at that time. I didn't have the courage to tell you, so I decided to wait until you two got divorced. I'm sorry for screwing you over and kicked your fifth place. For a moment, I felt sorry for him, but then I returned to my conviction that he got what he deserved. I even briefly thought about helping him with a job, but I remained silent. He betrayed me behind my back, and I wasn't sure he wouldn't do it again. What do you think of our story today? In my opinion, these stories are quite interesting because they contain several different thoughts about the same situation, and there is something to think about at leisure. What is your impression? Write in the comments. Until new videos.